Hello everybody, welcome back to another front-end system design video. In today's video, we will discuss designing an autocomplete, aka type ahead widget. This is yet another commonly asked front-end system design question. Autocomplete widget can be seen almost everywhere. Google uses it, Facebook uses it, and Itbiz uses it. It provides a search experience by providing suggestions relevant to users' query. Before we get started, please consider giving me a like and subscribe if you find the content useful. Without further ado, let's dive into it. As always, in this video, we will talk about the technical requirements, component architecture, APIs that we want to expose to the widget consumer, how we want to manage the data flow, design a cache, some optimizations and accessibilities. We will quickly go through some basic requirements here. First of all, we want the autocomplete widget to return a list of top suggestions based on user input. We want the suggestions to be ordered based on user input's recency and frequency. And because this is more of a front-end system design question, we want to focus our discussion more on the extensibility of the component, the performance of the component, and uh, the user experience. We want to ensure the cross-browser compatibility as well. So let's first take a look at the component architecture. I think the autocomplete widget could be broken down into three parts. The main component, which is the autocomplete component, the input element, and the suggestions list. Autocomplete component is like a parent component that orchestrates everything together. It has two separate children, the input element and suggestions list. Input element is a controlled component that takes user input. Suggestions list component takes in the suggestion data and output a list of items. Suggestions list could have different views for when there's not a matching suggestion or when there's an arrow or when the data is being loaded. Let's take a closer look at the autocomplete component and see what these properties do. So the very first property here, the result URL indicates what endpoint we want to load data from. Below there are different hooks. Uh, as you can see, on change hook, on confirm hook, on close hook, and on blur hook. These hooks handle different events. For example, we can specify the on change method to do something when the user input changes. The on confirm method can be specified when user confirms a suggestion. The on close method is for when the user clicks on the close button inside the input element. The on blur method handles when user clicks outside of the widget. Item renderer here is specified to decide what the suggestion item look like. As you can see in the LinkedIn example here, we can specify the item renderer to return a suggestion with its name, type, and industry. The number of results is pretty obvious. Down below, the input renderer, suggestion renderer, arrow view renderer, no suggestion renderer, loading renderer, they will be used to define what each section will look like. And in the end, we can specify a debounce interval. When this variable is specified, it indicates how long the request is going to be debounced. I think the autocomplete widget should also have internal states that saves the query and handles the cache. I think that's about it for the component architecture and the APIs that we want to expose. Next, let's talk a little bit about how do we load the suggestions when user queries. Suppose we have a get API like this, and if we decide to load everything from the server, the bottleneck is the network request and response waiting time. The good thing here is we are offloading the query matching to the server and we could have more up-to-date data when we get the response from the server because the server could be doing some async updates to the data. However, I think we can do slightly better by preloading some important data. This takes a lot of experimentation to understand what is the most important. On top of that, we should have a client-side cache that serves the user read. And only when there's a read miss, we request data from server. That way we reduce a lot of traffic to our server. And when we request data from the server, we can update the client-side cache as well. The other thing we could utilize is to debounce and throttle the request. In the next few slides, I'll show you 
some approaches to do debounce in React. In React, you can create your own use debounce hook. And inside the autocomplete component, you can define a search term state and use this use debounce hook on the search term. It will create a debounced search term. Then you can create a use effect hook that takes the dependency. Another concern here is if user types very quickly, there may be multiple requests in error and the responses could return asynchronously in a different order. When this happens, we have a couple of different approaches to handle it. First, we could have a variable that holds the last query. And if the response is not for the last query, then we just use the response to update to update the client side cache. Otherwise, we update the view and then also update the client side cache. The other approach requires the response to include the search term, and then we can compare the search term with the request response. We mentioned a little bit about the client side cache. So how do we design the client side cache? I think intuitively we can use a map which is essentially like a key value pair. The key is the search term and the value is the array of matches. This approach is okay because there could still be read miss and it could potentially have some duplications. So let's take a closer look at what it means to have duplications. Uh, for, for example, here, when the user types in B, the response is an array of objects. And then when the user types in uh, types BR, the, the whole entry for Brad is duplicated. We can optimize the data structure to use an ID that points to the index in the result array. So uh, see the example below, we use an results array that include an array of ID that points to uh, the emails array. There are some other optimizations that we could do here. For example, you can use IndexedDB to store the cache instead of like using local storage because IndexedDB has technically unlimited storage and we can pre-warm the cache so the user's first query is instant. This is also done by preloading the important data like I've mentioned before. Here are some other optimizations when the response is huge. We can use pagination or infinite scroll so that we can reduce the data uh, that is transferred over the network. And in the end, let's take a closer look at the accessibility criteria. Here are a few criteria from this awesome GitHub repo that I found online. You can read more about it and I have attached the link in the description. Um, thanks so much for watching. Let me know what you would like to see next and I'll see you in the next video.